We're going to begin a comprehensive tutorial on how to fly and fight the F-16. I'm going to say at the outset, I'm not a fighter pilot, and actual fighter pilots are probably going to see me do a lot of things that would make them cringe. However, I do enjoy flying DCS, and I started flight simming quite a few years ago, all the way back to the old Falcon 3.0 days. So there's always been a special place in my heart for the F-16. It's a beautiful and extremely capable aircraft and to this day remains one of the dominant forces in the sky. To learn the F-16, we're going to walk through the entire red flag campaign for the F-16, which you can find on DCS's website. It's a great campaign really designed around learning how to fly the F-16 well, and includes opportunities to do most things you can do with the F-16. In mission one, our goal will be to degrade Redland's integrated air defense system by taking out one of their radars. We'll be carrying two GBU-12 laser-guided bombs, air-to-air -air missiles, and ammunition for the ship's cannon. And our specific target will be a P-19 flat face radar. I'm going to show you how to take it out with bombs and also guns. All right, let's jump in. It's a beautiful day at Nellis Air Force Base in sunny Nevada. Other aircraft around us already have their turbines whirring, so let's go ahead and get the canopy closed and get this beast started up. We're gonna start by putting on the battery and setting the jet fuel switch to start one. Then we're going to watch the RPM meter on the right until the RPM is at 20%, at which point we're going to throttle forward into idle, which will get the engine up to its idling speed of 60%. All right, let's go ahead and get that idle up. Now we're just going to watch the RPM till it gets up to 60%, at which point it'll be time to switch over to main power and begin activating systems. On the avionics board, we're going to flip on all the switches except for the map, simply because this version of the F-16 doesn't use the map. For the red flag campaign, we're going to set the INS to stored heading and turn the mids LVT switch to on. We're going to go ahead and dial up all our panel lights, even though in the bright light it's not necessary. I find it's just good to have that done. You never know. Next, we're going to turn on all the features of our HUD, as well as our sensor power. We'll go ahead and uncage the SAI. Adjust the aircraft sensitivity to barometric pressure. It's currently 30.23, quite high. And if we don't make this adjustment, our altimeter will be substantially off. We'll lock the canopy and engage the ejection seat. Then we're going to pop over to our threat warning panel, turn it on, and activate the RWR and everything to do with countermeasures. We're going to turn the ILS and the TACN all the way down so they aren't making an annoying beeping noise throughout much of our flight. And then we're going to turn on our external lights, as well as the master IFF. There goes the A-10 squadron on their way to the runway. They get up in the air first because they can stay in the air for so long. Meanwhile, us fuel limited fighters will be going up into the air among the last. The flight plan designates we'll start our way to the runway at 2010 and take off at 2015. We still have plenty of time between then and now, so we're going to continue setting up everything on the F-16. We'll get our TACN and our ILS set up next. For this mission at Nellis, TACN is 12 X-ray and the ILS is at 109.10. And here I've forgotten to leave the ILS on. Without leaving it on, it will not accept a new frequency. So we're just going to look again to the ILS dial on the left, just below the throttle. Turn that up a bit, get the ILS frequency set, and then keep moving on along with the startup procedure. Forward to airborne. We can hear it receiving, so it's working fine now. 
So we'll turn it back off till we need it later on when it's time to come in for a landing. We're going to go ahead now and set the steer point to progress automatically. However, it's important to turn the steer point to manual progression before we drop the bombs. We'll cover that more later. In the past, I've forgotten to do this many times and it results in a miss. We'll talk about this more later. And then we'll set our heading bug for 220 degrees, which is the direction of the runway at Nellis Air Force Base when we come in for landing. The heading bug has many uses and I'm sure an actual fighter pilot can tell you a lot more about it than I can. I glance up quickly at the right MFD to make sure I've remembered to turn on the L-16, which allows my aircraft to network with and share data with other platforms in the combat theater. We can see one of the A-10s taking off in the distance. And we've now run through almost the entire startup procedure, with about five minutes left before we have to start rolling out toward the runway. Let's use this time to take a look at our mission plan. DCS is not an arcade game, it is a hardcore simulator. And because of this, it's important to have a thorough understanding of the mission parameters, the target, threats, even things such as rules of engagement, as well as the setting, your support, and perhaps above all, navigation. Let's take a look at the first few pages of the mission briefing. Mission 1 provides us with a brief overview, explaining what the goal of our mission is and the aircraft we might expect to have in support. Not every campaign will have a mission briefing laid out this thoroughly or even in this format. The second page is pretty straightforward. It tells you what weather you can expect, including direction and strength of the wind, and, very importantly, the barometric pressure at which to set your altimeter. In a place with almost perpetual blue skies like Nevada, this is very important, as the skies are always clear and the altitude is already high, so altimeters set to sea level will give a significantly erroneous reading. There goes the B-1B bomber. That's our cue to get ready to go. That is an amazing looking aircraft. So moving on quickly, the next two pages of the briefing tell us what to expect in terms of Redlands air and ground defenses. And page 5 is very important, as it contains many of the key details of our flight plan, including startup time, taxi time, departure time, martial orbit, and when the various elements of the assault package will push, including us. By the way, if you don't already know, we're the strike package in this mission, and we are dubbed Colt. Request taxi to runway. Colt, 1-1. One, one. Request taxi to runway. Normally we'd wait for ATC to give us clearance, but ATC is presently bugged, so we're just going to go ahead and get moving. Small point of note, there's plenty of airport and runway traffic at a military airbase, so always take the time to look left and right before turning onto something or crossing something. Two rolling means the wingmen are coming along. There are three wingmen in total. Taxiing with the F-16 is a bit of a skill in itself. As aircraft go, it's fairly tippy, especially if you're used to something with a wider undercarriage such as the F-A-18 or the A-10C. Just remember, when making any turns, slow down a bit more and take them a bit more gracefully.
We're going to request takeoff from ATC, but ATC is still bugged for whatever reason at Nellis. It seems to work okay for coming in for a landing, but for taking off, not so much. This is just since the last patch to my knowledge, so we'll request it. But we're going to ignore ATC and go ahead and get in the air. Request takeoff. Colt 1-1, one, one. request takeoff. If we sat here for a month, they still wouldn't clear us for takeoff, so let's go ahead and get rolling. Unlike other aircraft, just leave your flaps set in the normal position. Unless the ship has been damaged, the flap angle is taken care of automatically by the F-16's FLCS flight computer. Right around 70 knots, disengage your nose wheel steering and rely on rudder authority. You're going too fast to use the nose wheel at this time. It can destabilize the aircraft and, and lead to a dramatically nasty tip. I know, I know, I should have started pulling up sooner. Still, we're up in the air, safe and sound, things are good to go. Alright, we're going to get our wheels up and go ahead and begin a martial orbit, counterclockwise, just as is laid out in the briefing. And this will allow our wingmen to get up in the air with us. Now, due to this weird ATC bug this, this patch, our wingmen aren't going to go ahead and automatically take off and join up with us either. So I'm going to have to establish the orbit and issue them a join up command, at which point they'll start taking off. Normally everything works just fine, I don't know what's going on here. Flight, join up. Flight, join up. It's important, especially in the simulator, to maintain a martial orbit until your flight is joined up. Otherwise, they will still attempt to catch up with you, but try to do it on afterburner, which is going to make them blow through their fuel really, really fast. The result of that will be that you enter the combat theater with a flight that has to turn back home long before the mission's done. So until they've taken off, I'm just going to maintain my orbit and keep my speed somewhere between 350 and 400 knots or so. Don't have to be too precise here, you just want to keep the speed down so you aren't guzzling fuel and the flight has plenty of time and opportunity to catch up with you. Alright, we can hear on the radio now that they're rolling down the runway. We should hear another radio broadcast when they have gear up. At that point, they'll begin to join up with us. Until then, we'll maintain our orbit. When doing such orbits, it helps to use the landscape to plot your course visually. It's a lot easier than trying to look down and watch instruments all the time. I just aim toward downtown Las Vegas. And just before I get there, I swing back around toward Nellis. Do not fly directly over the runway. It's dangerous and also bad form. So our wingmen are in the air now, and they're catching up with me. I'm just going to continue this orbit. They should be fully caught up in about one more complete orbit. Four was lagging a bit behind. It might take him a little bit more time to catch up with us, but... I'm not going to hold off setting out too much for four, and he'll just be a bit behind us anyway. I don't think he's going to come after us on full afterburner. He'll blow a little bit of extra fuel, but we have plenty of fuel to get there and back in this mission. With the wingman mostly caught up, we're going to go ahead and start making progress toward the first steer point. However, throughout this, I'm going to keep the speed down, on or about 400 knots. This will allow the wingman to catch up without having to blow through too much of their fuel on afterburner. Two and three are nearly with me anyway. Four is lagging a bit behind, but we'll keep the speed down for a while. He'll have plenty of time to catch up. Station 
As soon as we reach steer point one, we're going to begin climbing at altitude. And our Marshall plan has us designated for flying somewhere between 16 and 19,000 feet. We're going to aim for the high side of that and aim to maintain between 18.5 and 19 angels. I do have my radar altimeter on and uh, Nevada is high country, thousands of feet over sea level. Plus there are mountains, so keep an eye on the radar altimeter. It's on the lower right, top of the numeric readout on the HUD. And its numeric reading is preceded by an R. On a clear day though, that's not all that important. You could optionally, if you were really looking at controlling your emissions, you could turn that radar altimeter off at a place like this. All right, we're gonna skip ahead a little till we get on the first navigation waypoint, or as they say when you're flying the Falcon, the first steer point. And about that time, we're going to hear some mission updates. All right, this next part is pretty much all scripted. Mission Control informs you that everything's a go and you can go ahead and navigate your planned course and to contact Dark Star for um, threat updates. In the meantime, I've gone ahead and hit the air to ground mode to set up the AG weapons. I'm carrying two GBU-12 laser guided bombs. I'll set them to fall in a pair and because they'll be guided by the Viper's laser on the targeting pod, and we already know exactly where the P-19 flat face radar is, it's currently set to a steer point, I've set up CCRP targeting. On the left side, I use the MFD to prepare the targeting pod, the TGP, and because it's a very bright day in the desert, I find the targeting pod easiest to read or interpret if I set the display to white hot. I also have the ship's emissions set to quiet so that we can receive transmissions, but we won't broadcast anything, or not much of anything. We're still broadcasting some things, such as our radar altimeter signal, but it does make us a lot quieter and harder to detect. And generally, for a mission like this, you want to be as stealthy as possible. I mean, the enemy knows we're coming, but you don't have to broadcast to them exactly where you are. I also have my master arm on, that's one less thing to worry about in the future, and it's ready to go in case I suddenly find myself in an air-to-air -air engagement. But the laser safety remains off. I understand that in actual practice, fighter pilots will keep the laser safety off until it's actually needed. This is because the laser is very powerful and could inadvertently blind an innocent civilian who happens to be on the ground. Again, I'll emphasize I'm not an actual fighter pilot. I'm just a guy who loves the sim. So if any fighter pilots do actually see this and you have anything to add or correct, I'm more than happy to hear from you. We're all set up now, so we'll turn off air to ground mode and focus on navigation. And now that we're about at our target altitude, I'm primarily going to leave navigation to the autopilot, except to occasionally make some altitude changes. I won't really be controlling the aircraft all that much directly until we are in the area where we're going to enter orbit, just outside the combat theater. And through the external view, we can finally see that Pokey 2, 3, and 4, my wingmen, are beginning to catch up to us. I'm still keeping my speed down to help them do so. But I'm getting close to the point where I'm going to accelerate and we're going to get up to full speed because, because this attack does need to happen on a tight schedule. If we reference our departure flow, we see that the strike package, that's us, needs to push from our orbit position at 2140 to 2145. We will be there with plenty of time to spare though, about 10 minutes, give or take. And when we arrive at the push point, we are going to set up a clockwise orbit or an orbit going right and hold there, make final preparations, and go ahead and push. And in the meantime, I'll just go ahead and check all the weapon settings and nav settings. Because unlike a video game, you can't just go and do it again. If you mess it up, mission's done. A lot like in the actual military, you have to do it right the first time, so you get in the habit of checking and checking again. So we're at steer point four now, and it's very close to steer point five. That's where we are technically supposed to begin our orbit. But I'm just going to begin a slow, gentle orbit at this point. It's easy enough to move on to steer point six from here. To keep us operating further away from the combat theater, we are going to make an orbit to the right or clockwise, and that'll give our own fighters plenty of time to do their work. While I enjoy air-to-air -air combat, we're not here for that purpose, not on this mission. We are here to make a ground strike. So we're only going to become involved in air-to-air -air if absolutely necessary. And orbiting to the right keeps us as far away from the enemy as possible and hopefully outside of their attention. At this point, I'm going to start carefully monitoring my external tank. I still have some fuel left in it, so I'm going to hang on to it for just now, but 
Once we start our run into the combat theater, it'll be close to empty and I'll drop it not long after we get going. That will give us the best fuel efficiency as well as maximizing our capability to gain speed and maneuverability. Remember, when you're in a fighter, in the air, energy is everything. With all of that done, we have nothing to do but orbit and wait now. As Red Flag is really a training campaign, I'm not at all averse to taking a look at the tactical map and getting a sense of what's going on outside the plane. Using it in this context can help us to understand those radio calls that we're always getting from Darkstar. We can see friendly fighters entering engagements with Redland. We can gain an understanding of how the bullseye is positioned on the map so that we can get an understanding of the bearings, ranges, and altitudes, the bras, called off by the AWACS, in this case, Darkstar. It's just something fun and also educational to do while we are in the process of learning DCS. I'm not exactly learning DCS. I've done DCS for years. I've done flight sims, and including combat flight sims for years. But you know, something I really love about DCS is it is so accurate that even though I have done DCS for years and other flight sims for as long as I have, there's always more to learn. I make it a point every day to do a little reading or pop onto an educational video and learn something else. And the depth is amazing to this very day. Every single day I study something new and go, oh, wow, I didn't know the F-16 or the F-18 or the A-10 or any of the other birds that I fly in DCS could do that. Learn some new aspect of how it assesses tactics or some new aspect of how it works with the AI. And it's just the depth is unbelievable. And that's one of the things that makes it really fun. But here in the Red Flag Campaign, our goal is education. The Red Flag Campaign exists to help a, a new player take all of those discrete skills they've been putting together and learning how to use the various components that are essential to operate to fly the F-16 and fight the F-16. It's here to help them learn to put that all together, think strategically and tactically and make the best decisions and have all of those differing skills come together fluidly. So yeah, take a look at that tactical map, learn where things are. Use the labeling to help you learn to identify friends and foes. Ultimately use the Red Flag campaign for what it was meant to be, an important learning opportunity. I mean, it's definitely important, right? That's why the military uses Red Flag exercises to train their pilots. In another episode down the road, we'll go more deeply into understanding things like how to interpret the, uh, the tactical map Put together the picture there and use that map early on to make your own decisions about how you're going to handle your mission. All right, I've skipped ahead to a little past 2140 and it's now time to take us out of orbit. We're not in a rush. It's several minutes before our maximum strike departure time. So we are going to go ahead and make a leisurely approach toward steer point five. But just a bit before we get there, we're going to go ahead and turn towards steer point six. You can see toward the right of the screen the contrails of a couple aircraft. It's not really relevant to what we're doing right now, but typically contrails are something you want to avoid because, well, as you can see, they scream that you're there. Steer point six is a sharp turn, and the F-16's autopilot does not handle sharp turns very smoothly, so I'm going to go ahead and punch us to steer point seven just a little bit early and give us plenty of time to make a gentle turn. In fact, I'll just make the turn manually. Once we have completed the turn, I'm going to put us back into autopilot and go ahead and double check everything once again. I think this makes the fourth or fifth sequence of double checking everything. Honestly, when you're flying something as complex as a military fighter, you cannot double check everything enough. I got into this habit long ago after doing missions and doing every bloody thing correctly, only to get to the point where I was supposed to fire a missile or drop ordnance to have something go wrong because I'd forgotten to turn a knob or flip a switch somewhere. Get into the habit of it. Double check, triple check, quadruple check, pentuple check, and so on and so forth. If you have spare time, you should be double checking. 
All players, Dark Star, East, HQ-7, destroyed. Pushing from waypoint 7 at 12,000. East HQ-7 is destroyed. That's our cue that the SAM that we would have had to worry about is now out of play. As long as the fighters already in the combat theater have done their job well and taken out Redland's air defenses, this should be a smooth trip in. At this point, things begin to get busy really fast, so I'm going to go ahead and arm the laser. I'm not going to fire it yet, but now it is ready. I'm in I'm in the combat zone, and in the heat of the moment, I don't want to forget to have that laser ready to go when I need it. When it's time to drop those bombs, everything's going to happen really fast. Dark Star, request picture. Dark Star, 1-1, one, one. Colt, 1-1, one, one. request picture. Colt, 1-1, one, one. Dark Star, 1-1, one, one. clean. You may have noticed I'm using audio commands for the radio comms. I'm using audio commands to talk to my wingmen, as well as to the AWACS, ATC, and anything else that requires radio comms. This is made possible through two applications. Voice Attack, which has been around forever and is really, really good at utilizing voice commands. And VACOM, which is specifically for DCS and works with the dynamic nature of DCS. It enables voice attack to customize voice commands to fit each mission profile. It's also what provides things like the background chatter and gives me a voice activated kneeboard that shows all the command options available to me, shows notes on the mission, shows my location, many, many other things. I'm using an ultra wide display, so when I have my kneeboard up, which is a lot, it's off the screen to the right and doesn't turn up with the screen capture application. Triple A at bullseye 226 for 30. Radio check. Flight 221 for 30. As we get closer and closer to the combat theater and approach our target, keep an eye on your MFD. When your L-16 data link is turned on, it will show you the known location of threats. Also watch your RWR and always be sure to keep track of the skies. Open formation. Flight, open formation. I've noticed some air radar activity ahead and off to the right, so I've ordered my flight formation to open up. This will spread out my wingman a little bit so we all aren't clumped together, and have some maneuvering room if things get hot really fast. That radar activity in front of us continues to be out there. It's not making me happy. We were not locked, or at least I'm not locked. But I'm fairly sure some Redland birds have gotten through. I'm gonna check in with AWACS and get their opinion. Dark Star, request picture. Colt 1 1, Dark Star 1 1, clean. In from the northeast, engaging the AM at bullseye 2 4 8 4 27. Now Darkstar says we're clean, but in Redland, clean doesn't mean that there are no fighters out there. After all, the Red Flag event is just a military game, a military exercise, intended for training purposes. Fighters aren't say, actually shot down, they, they go to a holding area where they wait to re-enter the fray, 
After all, they're going to come back in over and over again because the military wants to make this an educational experience for all the pilots. And to accomplish this, they're going to make it that they can come back into the fray over and over again and get more learning opportunities. In a practical sense, what that means for us is that Dark Star is going to call the theater is clear if there are currently dead fighters orbiting in their holding area, but that can change very, very quickly in just a moment when those dead fighters come back into play again. Since they're already flying in orbit, all they have to do is re-enter the combat theater at full speed. Pontiac, defending Sam at Falls 2, 4, 8, 4, 20. It's still quiet, and my external fuel tanks are pretty low now. And we're getting well into the combat theater and could see action at any moment, air to air or air to ground. So I want to go ahead and dump my external fuel tanks. If we do see action, I want to have maximum speed and maneuverability. You can see them dropping away here. Remember to turn master on to off or safe when you drop those tanks, otherwise you'll let go some ordnance at the same time. And of course, remember to turn master arm back to armed when you're done. Notice those frequent radio broadcasts. Flying a fast-moving and complex aircraft like the F-16 Viper can be very consuming, but it's important to pay attention to these radio broadcasts. They clue you in to what's going on in the theater and what your people are doing. One of those broadcasts let us know there's some AAA defense going on in the theater, and the AAA, the anti-aircraft artillery, is being attacked, as well as fortified positions. We can see this activity if we switch back over to the tactical map where we can see elements of our strike package closing in on the targets. Watching that map also reminds us to be sure to adhere to the scheduling of the attacks. If you go in too early, you'll be overwhelmed by enemy fighters. And if you wait to too late, killed enemy fighters will be leaving their regeneration boxes and re-entering the fray, so once again you'll be overwhelmed. In fact, we are just about to encounter some regenerated fighters that are just now coming back into the theater. Engage bandits. At 14 nautical miles out from steer point 9, coming in from ahead and to the right, we can see an entire wing of bogies just above us. I want to stay mission focused, so using voice attack I issue a verbal command to the wing to take out the bogies. And while continuing to fly on course, I do keep an eye on the bogies. Always keep your head on a swivel. If any of them happens to aim toward me or gets a missile off, I want to respond quickly. And in the F-16 I can switch very quickly over to missile mode and return fire. Turns out to be a non-issue though. My three wingmen were easily able to take out the four Redland aircraft. And as soon as that's done, I issue a verbal order to have them rejoin formation. Now at this point, remaining mission focused, I'm going to go ahead and steer toward steer point 10, punch the air to ground mode button, and get the ship ready to make its bombing run. Now my altimeter reports that I'm about 21 angels up. That is to say, 21,000 feet and a little change. But Nevada is high desert or high country. And the standard altimeter is barometric. It's the radar altimeter that we have to watch here. And it reports that we're at about 13.5 angels. This is good. The closer we are to the ground, the less time the bombs will need to fall. And that matters because the bombs have to be guided in with the laser mounted on the TGP, the targeting pod. The targeting pod itself is on the right cheek or right side of the fuselage of the F-16. And it has a wide angle of movement anywhere from straight ahead and off to the right and straight down. But it cannot turn much past straight down, so if we overshoot the target, the laser will lose its lock. What we want to do here is stay low enough to minimize the time it takes for the bombs to fall, while being high enough to protect ourselves from any of the basic air defenses that might still be in Redland's control, such as handheld SAMs and AAA flak. Between 13 and 14 angels should be pretty good for this bomb run. Also make sure you have set your steer point to manual progression, because the TGP is set to target on the steer point, that's the known location of our target. And if your bird overshoots the steer point, or even gets too close, and you have automatic steer point progression activated, the steer point will go ahead and automatically progress, and your targeting laser will move to focus on the new steer point, and that will absolutely guaranteed cause your laser guided bombs to miss. Our guys are still taking out enemy air defenses, and Darkstar reports the combat theater is clear of Redland aircraft. 
So at this point, we're going to make sure that we're flying roughly level. And we're going to make sure we're going about or below 400 knots. And be ready to drop the LGBs, the laser guided bombs. What we're doing is keeping that vertical line in front of us dead center. That indicates the orientation of the bomb trajectory. And at about 9 seconds before we are supposed to launch the bombs, we're going to see a short horizontal tab begin to descend from the top of the HUD. The moment that tab begins to descend, we're going to hold down the bomb release button. There goes the tab, we're holding the bomb release button and we are going to continue to hold it until it reaches the horizon line on the HUD. You can actually hear the bombs detached and if you look left and right you can see that they have fallen away from the wings as well. Now we're going to bank about 45 degrees away from our target to make sure that we don't overshoot it as the bombs fall. And we're just going to maintain that gentle turn to maximize the time our TGP can point at the target. The HUD also shows us time till impact. And when there are only 10 to 15 seconds left till the bombs impact, we turn on the laser by squeezing the trigger to the first stage and holding it, allowing the bombs plenty of time for their final alignment onto the target. LGBs are very accurate and reliable, and in the MFD that portrays the TGP's view, we can see our target has been hit. Two laser-guided GBU-12s, that should be sufficient to blow up a flat-faced radar. Now if you've missed and you've spent both your bombs, don't despair, you have two options in front of you. Your wingmen are also carrying GBU-12s and you can order them into the attack. Or if you're good with air-to-ground cannon and you're confident you can evade any ground defenses, you can go ahead and dive and take that target out with guns just as well. Here I'll demonstrate. I've spent hundreds of hours learning the A-10C and one of the benefits of that is I got to be awfully good with air-to-ground guns. So having already dropped our bombs, we're going to maintain an air-to-ground mode and just be sure we turn our guns on, come back around and line up on our target, and begin a dive. I'm going to do a fairly steep dive because there are air defenses all around here, so I do not want to do a safer, shallower dive, which would give me more time to hit the target and not have the ground racing up at me so fast, but also give Redland plenty of time and opportunity to shoot at me with whatever defenses they may still have lying around. The aiming pip on the F-16 is remarkably straightforward, simple to use. Just get the middle of the circle lined up on your target. And watch for the tab within this bull to begin to wind counterclockwise, indicating when you're within range. Once lined up and in range, open up. Short burst on the target, a long burst if you are definitely sure you're on the target, always bearing in mind that in the real world, a jet fighter cannon will burn through its ammunition load in seconds. We're going to hit the burners and speed away, dropping some chaff and flares just in case something has been shot at us and jinking too in case there's some AAA we didn't notice. And a quick glance back to make sure that we see a smoking plume coming off the target. And there it is. We're good to go. We're getting out of here. Dark Star request picture. Dark Star 1 1. Colt 1 1. Request picture. Colt 1 1. Dark Star 1 1. Clean. Engage ground targets. Flight. Engage targets of opportunity. All right, my ordinance has been discharged, so I'm going to begin heading back, and I'm going to cut my wingmen loose and let them do a little additional damage and have their fun. When they've dropped their ordinance, I'll go ahead and order them to return to base. The flight home is pretty standard. We're just going to follow the steer points, occasionally checking in with Darkstar to make sure that the theater remains clean. As a rule in the F-16 Red Flag campaign, you don't often find enemy fighters coming out to meet you. But I really enjoy this campaign and I've been through it several times and it has happened once or twice that a stray Redland fighter was in an unusual position and did decide to go after me. So keep an eye on your RWR for signs of electronic threats and be sure to check in with Darkstar now and then and make sure the situation does in fact remain clean. Darkstar request picture. Darkstar 1-1. Colt 1-1. Request picture. If anything looks questionable, make the bogey dope call. 
Then call again a minute or so later and see if the contact of concern seems to be heading your way. If something looks suspicious as a rule of thumb, consider it suspicious. But at this point, the best way to protect yourself is get to about 20 angels and throttle up to full without going into afterburner to get back to Nellis. Typically, once you get past the no-fly zone and turn south, it's going to be home free from there. And remember, if you had your radar on for any reason, turn it back to silent. Only use your radars when you need a lock on or to confirm something about ground terrain. Otherwise, keep it off because it is a great big screaming indicator that you're out there. It gives the enemy something to head toward and something to aim at. And when your radar is on, the enemy can see you twice as far away as you can see them. All right, at this point, there really is nothing to do except to do a long flight home, most of which I'm going to let be handled by the autopilot. So we're just going to skip ahead to the final leg of the journey. Inbound. We are now navigating toward the last steer point, at the end of which is Nellis Air Force Base. If you have already familiarized yourself with this map, then you know that we're going to pass over these mountains directly below us right now and come to a little village just outside of Nellis Air Force Base. At that point, we're going to turn to heading roughly 220 and prepare for a landing. I've already called inbound to inform Nellis that we're coming. They've given me a heading to fly, but this is a simulator. I'm not going to fly it exactly. I have my preferred route to fly into Nellis from here. And ahead and to the right upper center of the screen, we can just begin to see Nellis coming into view. We're going to continue a gentle descent and throttle back quite a bit to help the ship slow down, at this time just taking advantage of air resistance. However, the fact that we are descending is going to keep our speed up too because, well, it's like going downhill. ATC in DCS is a bit buggy right now. Nevertheless, when we get close enough to the airport, I'm going to get a radio message to contact ATC, at which point I'll request the landing. You do not have to manually extend your flaps to land with the F-16. The flight computer controls this quite well. All you need to do is decide when you're going to extend your air brakes and drop your undercarriage. Up ahead is an important landmark, the racetrack. It lies just beyond the runway, so as we approach it, we're going to start slowly steering into it. We want to be more or less facing the runway by the time we pass the racetrack. That's the signal to request the landing. Request landing. We've gotten clearance to go ahead and land, and we've done a fly over the runway, ensuring that the runway is free of debris, free of damaged aircraft, free of anything else that might create a hazard. I'm going to do a sharp turn here by turning up into the air and then coming back down, which is a very fast way for an aircraft to make a turn, and watching my speed because F-16s are speed, not only speed demons, but speed lovers. They really need speed or they will fall out of the sky. We are going to run back toward that village a few miles north of Nellis, and we're going to do a 180 right about there, line back up on the runway and come in for a landing. And before I embarrass myself, let me just say that I'm used to the Thrustmaster Warthog joystick and I just recently got a VKB MCG Pro. I am absolutely loving this stick, but it is super sensitive and I'm still getting the curves and adjustments down to where I like it. So hopefully I don't embarrass myself on the landing. I have the joystick laid out pretty similarly to how I had the Warthog laid out. There are more buttons and axes available. But the real thing is the Gunfighter 3 base, it is so smooth and accurate, 
and I just am not used to this level of accuracy. And landing is pretty touch and go. I should say touchy. It, it takes a light touch. Hopefully I do this right. Like landing is takes a lot more sensitivity than combat and dropping bombs. That's that's pretty straightforward, crude work. Also, if you're wondering how it is I can pan around so smoothly to observe my view, I'm using Track IR. I've been using Track IR for years. I'm a huge fan of it. I prefer it over virtual reality because I like to see my controls. And uh, I just find it works really well for my needs. All right, we're on the last leg of this. I have my throttle down. I've extended my air brakes as well as my flaps and dropped my landing gear. All of that is going to add to air friction. We're going to pull up in a bit and get our airspeed down even more. We need it high enough up. And if we do this just right, our airspeed will drop enough just before we hit the runway that we can begin to bring up our nose and bring ourselves in for a perfect angle of attack on the runway. I've also turned the Tacken and the ILS on, though really with visibility this good, that's more formality than a necessity. You can hear them beeping in the background. Pulling up our nose just a little bit more while at the same time throttling down allows us to bleed off that last little bit of extra velocity we want and yeah, nice smooth touchdown. That's always what we want to see. As soon as we start to lose rudder authority, we're going to turn on the NWS, the nose wheel steering, keep our feet down on the brakes the whole time and slow the ship down. And just before we reach the first turnoff, call into ATC and request parking. Thank you for joining me on the Cerulean Skies channel. I hope you enjoyed this video, which takes place in the first mission of the Red Flag campaign for the F-16, where we are studying how to put all the discrete skills of flying this aircraft together. If you have any thoughts, observations, or questions, please leave them in the messages below. I'd be more than happy to hear from you. And if you liked what you see, as always, please take a moment to like and subscribe. It really helps.